But the way in which we put this together, whether it's performance art, whether it's ways in which the programming, which is important to the trail, happens in a very artistic way, the way in which artists that we can't even now imagine who are not yet quite born are going to be creating work on this trail. I'm uh, Beth White at the Trust for Public Land, where the project coordinator on this uh, wonderful, exciting initiative. And I just have a few announcements and a few people I'm going to ask to raise their hands if they're in the room. We're uh, part of the team working on civic engagement, um, plugging all of you in as volunteers, and um, I see everyone nodding because they're ready to do that. Um, and also the fundraising. So there are a couple people in the audience of Bonnie Taws and Helen Doria are here, if they'd stand up and raise their hands. Um, they're working on programming, and they wanted me to be sure to remind you there's a program survey out in the hall. So if you didn't make the open house before the meeting, there's a second one afterwards. So we want to get your ideas about the type of programming you want to see up on the Bloomingdale and during the construction. There's also an advisory council for the new Julia de Burgos Park at Albany Whipple, the first of the new access parks. And we want you to sign up for that, so we have that information for you and some frequently asked questions. Jamie Simone, who's in the audience or in the hall, she's our director of urban parks, and uh, she is here also to talk to you about Milwaukee Levitt, which will be the next of the new grade level access parks, and there's some uh, revised drawings of that park out in the hallway for you to see, and uh, it's, um, and there's Emily in the front, and Andrew from NVBA, who are designing that little park. We're hoping to break ground on that in June, so if you would stop by and give us your reactions. We've had a couple of public meetings, but we wanted to use the occasion tonight for, for another round of input on that. And then um, Shana Melanson and Ken Modzaleski, if you're here, if you'd stand up and wave to folks. Um, these are our philanthropy staff who are working on the fundraising, so um, we really want you to get to know them as well. If anybody wants to pull out a checkbook tonight, uh, Ken would be happy or Shana would be happy. But seriously, um, all of the staff at TPL would, oh, and Jamie's here in the doorway with her daughter, Lucy. So um, if you have any questions about how to get involved, um, what's going on next, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, we're more than happy to answer your questions and plug you in. So I don't want to take any more time away from the presentation, but I do want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge a few people that are here. Uh, Alderman Ray Cologne is with us tonight, so thank you very much. It's been a wonderful support on this project. Uh, and I uh, believe uh, Carrie Stojic is also here from Alderman Wagesbeck's office. And um, I didn't see anyone else come in, but if I missed you, please uh, stand up if you're from any of the Alderman's offices. Um, we've had wonderful Aldermanic support on this project, and uh, it's been great getting to work with all of our Aldermen. Um, with that, I think I'm going to move into the presentation because we've got the whole team here, as you can see, and everybody here is going to um, uh, speak tonight. So we have a, a lot of great things to cover. I think everyone knows um, that this is our final uh, meeting for the phase one. Uh, that's just the phase one. We will be having uh, lots of future uh, meetings and, and, and chances for input into the future. Um, but what, we're gonna, what you're going to see tonight is that we're going to not walk you through every last detail because we'd all be here for hours. Um, but uh, we're going to try to hit all of the major highlights that are going uh, into that and what we've heard and, and how we have reacted and changed what we are doing based on what we've been hearing over the last couple of meetings. Part of the reason that there are all those big printouts on the wall out there is to give you a chance to sort of absorb some of that, this in a little bit more detail. Um, and uh, I will repeat this again at the end, but of course there, there are formal comment cards uh, that were at the front. There'll be more. We'll hand them out. Uh, those will be available for you at the end. And of course we will have Q&A after the presentation. So with that, I just want to talk a little bit about our last public meeting. I know it says um, public meeting number two because that's officially what we called it, but of course there was the charrette. So really it was the third um, outreach process. Um, major outreach process as part of this. Um, I thought it was a great meeting. It was wonderfully attended. We got a lot of good feedback. 
Um, you know, there were definitely some themes that were brought up that we've been hearing pretty consistently, um, which is, is very helpful for us because it, it tells us if are we um, are we clearly communicating the message? Are we addressing those issues? Um, there were some new things that were uh, were brought up. Uh, we did have a little bit of a feedback loop. We wanted to continue some of the wonderful um, feedback we were getting from the, the charrette process. And so we had a little exercise with stickies. And um, obviously today we've got the uh, boards and the comment cards. Next slide. So we're going to walk you through, as I said, um, the framework plan. Um, not every last little detail, but we're gonna, we're gonna cover a lot of material tonight. Um, so this is sort of a rough outline of what it's going to look like, and with that, I am going to turn it over to the team and Tom Kennedy from there. You've got your mic. Is this one working too? Maybe I have to turn mine off. Now turn yours on. Just give me yours. This is well written. This is off now. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> well, as you can see, this is well rehearsed. Um, the, uh, the framework plan, as we, we talked about it, has lots of sections. And we started off way back in June last year with, um, I think the first time we, we talked, and I see some, what seemed to me anyway, very familiar faces um, in the audience, that uh, it's one of those times when you think, oh, I know you. But I, you know, I, I know you from your comments and I know you from your feedback, I don't really know you. So it's kind of weird standing here looking down at you. Um, but we worked really hard to understand what you wanted. Because this isn't a trail for me or for Carol or for Andrew. This is a trail for you. This is your thing. So uh, we can guide, we can help, we can show you things. And we started off with by saying, you know, oh, let's look at the promenade plantain in Paris. And let's look at uh, the highlights. God forbid. Um, and let's look at some other examples of these great things around the world. And we then concluded and said, that doesn't cut it. It's, it's not what we need. It's not what we've got. It's not got the, the bridges and the history. And it's not got what we want this thing to be. Um, and we heard that from you. And so we've kind of left those and moved on and evolved as we've gone uh, on with the design and the thought of it into something that I think uh, when we go through it, you'll see is very local and is very Chicago, um, as I'm learning still. Um, you know, I've, I've been here a few years now, I'm still the new guy. I don't, I don't know what it is with Chicago, you've got to be here 20 years before you become one of the people. So I'm working on it, but I'm getting there. The accent will never change though, don't think that's going to happen. Um, so what we wanted to do tonight was not, as Janet said, go through everything, but really hit the high spots. Um, and the objectives and guidelines part, we went through last time we met, um, and we went through that in very sort of brisk, here's the objective, let's go through, blah blah blah, and there we're at the end, with some image. Now we've got a lot more meat under those things, so we wanted to talk about those in a lot more detail. Uh, we also wanted to do, uh, we're in a place now where we can think about this thing, whatever it might be, as a concept for the entire length. So we've got a, a thought of how this could be resolved with all these guidelines and objectives over the entire length. So we want to walk through that with you as well. And then we want to walk through the implementation of how it's going to happen, where the money is, the pieces that have to go into place, and all of that. Um, and so this has actually been quite an interesting ride. And um, I, I can hear Janet's watch ticking, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, but uh, we're going to have uh, Carol start, then Andrew and, and John um, I'm going to take it as a, a team and, and go through it. Um, so I'm going to hand off to Carol first to take you through the first couple of pieces. Um, good evening. For those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Carol Ross Barney. <coughs> and my company, Ross Barney Architects, have, we've been lucky to be the planners um, and architects on this job. Um, and I'm going to um, start with objective one. And uh, very basically, objective one is to honor what the basic traits of the Bloomingdale Trail, what it is. It was really interesting. We started out this process, and at one point we said, well, how, you know, this should be about Chicago. How can we make this trail more Chicago? You can't. This is as Chicago as it is. And so um, our sub-bullets under this are, they, are they um, 
promote that, to capitalize on the experience of created by this elevated structure, to preserve the sense of discovery on the site, and to enhance the connection to the natural world. Um, one of the nice things about this project is it's the next age of parks, reclaiming urban land and turning it into green space in our city. Um, highlight the unique construction methods of the existing retaining walls. Um, one of the things that I, I know people found most interesting at the workshop was um, the story about how the trail was built. Um, it's going to be 100 years old when we reopen it as a park. Uh, so it's, it'll be like having a gigantic birthday for it. Um, and restore and rehabilitate the industrial infrastructure to meet the current standards. So, um, to do that, we looked, at, we looked at the trail itself. We inventoried it. It was very long, very flat, and very straight. And so, we looked at ways to um, create diversity, and um, one um, technique that definitely um, comes to mind is that we, within, within the boundaries of the retaining walls, we can change the elevation. And that serves to provide us with um, ecological diversity. We can make areas that are um, wetter, we can make areas that are more shaded. It also provides us with that sense of discovery that we were looking for. And it has some extra added advantages. It makes it easier for us to access it when we can lower the grade. And it helps us calm traffic on the trail, which will be a topic we'll hit um, more as we go along. We've prepared a number of <coughs> sketches for you to see tonight um, that we hope will give you an idea of what a wonderful place this is, um, wonderful in all seasons. So um, infrastructure, we basically have two pieces of infrastructure to work with, our design tools. One is the landscape itself. And, um, the possibilities here are to use the landscape as a filter, make more shade, um, shelter it from shelter you from the wind. Um, we're hoping to also um, use this structure to, to make this landscape more sustainable. You can see this drawing shows a suggestion for um, actually collecting stormwater and using it both to irrigate the trail and possibly some plantings along the trail. And um, a lot of people have had questions about this. The existing infrastructure, the half of this effort that you haven't seen in our public meetings has been a pretty thorough inventory of the trail and uh, the industrial infrastructure that creates it. Um, the good news, and keep, I want to stand this slide a little bit longer. The good news is that almost all of the um, structural um, infrastructure can be repaired and maintained. Uh, there is a possibility that there will be some bridge replacements in the future, but those aren't required now, and if we do them, it'll be for reasons other than, than safety or security or anything like that. It'll be because of the one that's suggested up here is accident prevention. And then the other question is just about the general finish of the retaining walls up and down Blooming, or the Bloomingdale Avenue, and, ge and those predominantly will just be able to repair the surface damage. So that's all good news. Now I can go to the next slide. Um, for the next slide, I'm going to turn this over to our partners in this effort. Um, Andrew Gutterman from MBVA. Thanks, Carol. I'm Andrew Gutterman with Michael Van Valkenberg Associates. We're the landscape architects uh, as part of the design team on the project. Um, objective number two in the framework plan is actually uh, new since the last uh, meeting that we had, and it's really um, based on the feedback that we got on, at that meeting. It's new to the document, but it's not at all new to the way that um, we've all been thinking about this project since the beginning. Um, and the objective is to balance the trail and park aspirations for the project. And this is a really unique thing, a unique and I, I think exciting thing about this project in that um, you know, it's very clear that the community is interested in having uh, something that has the, the variety um, and the feeling of being a part of its connecting existing and new parks, as well as becoming its own, uh, and also um, to use it as a transportation corridor, as a way of getting off of the streets um, into a safer environment. So to balance these things, um, 
first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the aspects that will make it a great park. And, and the first of those is the planting. Um, along a large length of the trail, um, it's not very wide, it's about 30 feet wide. And uh, of course, we're going to have pathways and, and benches and other amenities. So the planting really needs to do a lot of work in a small amount of space. And we see the, the role for planting of really you know, creating that um, experience of being in nature, of being in a park-like setting, and have begun to lay out guidelines for um, the use of different layers of vegetation, the canopy trees, the kind of understory, uh, the ground plane. You can see some of this in more detail. Um, in the hallway, but um, you know, as a way of really creating depth and texture and color and really all the things that that make it you know pleasant to be in a park year round. Now, when you combine those guidelines with the idea um, that Carol mentioned earlier of the topographic change, the undulation of the ground and the pathways. Uh, the result, we think, is um, a richer, more varied experience, which um, you know, we think is one key ingredient in successful parks, that it's not one thing all the time, but it can be many things at once. This is kind of a fun um, study that we did. These are actually birds that could be expected to be in the park based on the planting that we're proposing. And, um, you know, it's just a, such a unique opportunity to create a, a kind of um, environment right in the city um, for wildlife like this. And, you know, maybe that's sort of the beginning of the kind of soundtrack for the, the park. All those birds singing up there would be really wonderful. The other aspect is, of course, um, encouraging people to uh, come to the park and to linger and have places to sit that are comfortable, um, that provide different viewpoints, um, some outward looking, you know, there's some great views from up there uh, and vistas, and some more inward looking for having conversations with your friends or people watching, being up on the trail and, you know, seeing who else is up there. So really a variety of um, approaches to seating. Uh, these are, we took sort of little slices through the um, concept plan. You find uh, these ideas about different ways of uh, having seating up on the trail. And then a view of, um, you know, what one of those seating areas might look like, where it's separated from the multi-use path by planting, but you can still see, um, you know, over the plants so that there's always a feeling of um, safety while at the same time, you know, having some privacy as well. So I've talked about, um, you know, some of the elements that um, create the park set, the park-like setting for the project. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the, the design of the multi-use path, which is a really vital aspect of, of this project and something that, you know, the team has worked uh, really hard at developing. Fortunately, we have um, uh, a lot of sources that we can go to to guide us in terms of what the appropriate uh, design parameters for the path should be. There are um, documents prepared by an organization called the Ashto. That's it spelled out at the bottom. Um, there are also <laughs> Illinois um, DOT has extensive um, research and guidelines. And, you know, they really look at, you know, uh, different contexts and different types of multi-use paths and come up with recommendations. Um, most of them, uh, or rather all of them, uh, are consistent in terms of recommending an overall path with width of between 10 and 14 feet for um, the, the type of volume that we anticipate on this trail. Um, as well as other criteria for um, sight lines and uh, safety, and we've either met or exceeded all of those in our design. Um, 
multi-use paths can work, and they can work even in Chicago. Uh, these are a couple examples of, of uh, multi-use paths here in the city, and we also looked at others, if you go to the next slide, uh, around the country. And you know you can see at the bottom some of the statistics about these paths, and uh, you know many of them, uh, as I said, are either between 10 to 12, maybe 14 feet wide. Uh, this is in Washington D.C. Um, you can see in an urban area. Um, this is one uh, just outside of Boston that I'm very familiar with. The Minuteman Trail goes through residential and commercial areas. Um, outside of the city, um, another Boston example. Um, but you can see at the bottom, you know, eight to 10 feet, actually that's a little narrow, but uh, 10 feet, 12 feet. Um, so there are examples, and again, these are not meant as examples of what this project is going to look like. We're doing a lot more than, than that. These are what we call rails to trails projects, which are simply just the conversion of um, you know, formal railroad right of way into a bike path. These are not parks. We're creating both a park and a trail. We also looked at the Lakefront Trail and talked a lot about that. We know that it's um, on everyone's minds here. And um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see this is that is the um, what the federal DOT recorded as the average uh, hourly usage for the lakefront trail. Uh, I believe the next slide has a chart from this DOT study that lists, uh, it's about almost 20 different multi-use paths. And the lakefront trail sort of leaps off the page. I mean, it is an animal all to itself with you know nearly four times the amount of traffic as the Minuteman Bikeway, which I know to be quite busy, um, you know, outside of Boston. Even I was on the South Bay Trail um, this winter in Santa Monica, which, I mean, that's downtown LA right on the beach, and that has uh, about a quarter of, of the volume. Um, so it's a unique situation that we will not be replicating on the Moondale. Next slide. Um, gets into our recommendations, but just before we leave the Lakefront Trail, I want to make a couple more quick points about the difference between it and Bloomingdale. The volume is one, certainly that's a big one. The other is the context. If you think about it, there's a lot of um, cross traffic on the Lakefront Trail because of where it is. The Bloomingdale will have, there will be areas where people will want to cross the path because of viewpoints and so forth. But those are, you know, in distinct moments, not across the entire length. Um, it's also not nearly as long, so it's not going to be as attractive for people who are trying to, you know, train for races. So it's really a very different, it's, it's really apples and oranges. Um, so what are we recommending for the Bloomingdale? Our plan uh, calls for a 14-foot wide multi-use trail across the entire length of the Bloomingdale. That's 14 foot minimum. It does widen out at places like access points where there'll be higher volume, there'll be a need for trans, you know, transitioning. Um, the 14 feet is made up of a 10 foot central shared use path for bikes and pedestrians, plus two foot, path, two foot wide paths on each side for pedestrians only. The next slide, please. In addition to that, we've included a mile and a half of additional pedestrian-only walkways that are largely concentrated near access points and also in areas where we anticipate more leisurely use um, of, of the park. And so you can see um, a cross-section of that um, on, on the bottom, the, the width of that path will vary. Um, we're also removing uh, some of the retaining walls where we have parks adjacent to the, to the trail, and that way really um, widening effectively 
the space that, that these uh, paths are, are going through. Um, so these diagrams just show in, pur in sort of purple is the, uh, the 14 foot wide trail and then in blue are the is the additional series of, of pedestrian walkways. And then of course there'll be signage, um, there'll be striping, there'll be uh, material differences, uh, there'll be alignment changes, all of which are really designed to make it very clear that this is not a place that's meant for high speed uh, bicycle traffic, but is really meant to be welcoming and safe <coughs> for everyone. This is just uh, one of the, the sketches um, of what, what that might look like in, in a portion of the trail. So you can see the walking path on the side. Carol. Okay, objective number three, create a signature public space. Um, and I sub objectives under there. Um, it really came out of, of the uh, work we did with your community. We have um, decided to concentrate gathering spaces and activity spaces in the parks rather than on the trail paths. The trail path will be dedicated to linear movement, basically to connect those other activities and to connect the community. Um, that will help us because we'll be able to create unique experiences when we're transitioning from the street level to um, the top of the trail. This is really interesting. I, I've said this to a number of people. In a way, the design of this has relied on our ability to take a structure that was purposefully designed to keep people off and make it welcoming. <laughs> So um, from that point, I mean, if you think about it that way, it will give you some help in, in understanding some of the uh, challenges we face. Um, a really important one, respond to um, neighbors' privacy. And then finally, create a unified experience that identifies the Bloomingdale Trail. So I'm going to um, show you some of our ideas about privacy. The uh, trail is really unique in that it's bordered directly um, just about half its length by residential buildings. Uh, we think that using the, um, the design interventions that Andrew talked about, uh, that I talked about, changing the, uh, the topography of the trail, and by providing different types of planting as well as physical separation, we can accomplish the privacy that the neighbors um, deserve and require. Objective four. This was another really important one. Integrate the blooming, integrate access into the city's transportation and social infrastructure. Provide a variety of access points, safe access points, and use the city um, infrastructure to locate those. So our proposal, our design proposal, is to create a total, initially, of eight access points. This will um, Start, I like to think about them this way. There are two trailheads which have um, unique conditions. Both of those, we talked about removing parts of the retaining wall and spilling down to the ground level. That's the type of experience we want to create at the trailheads. Then we have um, four existing parks outside of the trailheads that we will be um, proposing um, access. In this case, the access wants to be generous. We have some um, sketches later on uh, that show what it might be like, but it's important that at those points the trail and the park become one. And then we have um, more access points than um, parks. Um, we added these for a, a number of reasons. One was to keep the distance reasonable for accessing the park. And so you can see they're actually classified by color here, the two trailheads, the four parks, and then the two singular points. And what that does is it lets, it, lets us keep the distance between access points reasonable. Oh, and this is, this is another view of, um, of the access point. This would be at Kimball, how we're imagining Kimball. Um, while that is our initial plan, we think that there are other points that need to be considered. You can see them here. Um, basically, in the end, we um, 
allow one eighth of a mile access. So our, our future access points are shown here. Central Park, Headsey, Humble. Um, you, you can see them. Okay. Um, talking about those individual non-park access points, we're proposing that those be created in the public right-of-way, in the right-of-way of Bloomingdale Avenue. Um, we have Bloomingdale right now um, generally consists of two traffic, two traffic lanes, one sometimes used for parking. And we're proposing that um, the new configuration where we have an access will leave a one lane for traffic and then we'll occupy eight feet of that right of way with a ramp and a stair. And this view here, in fact, this is right here. And you can see how we're anticipating that would work. Objective five. I think, is this one's for Tom? This is me. You're, you're the safe, uh, the uh, <laughs> guy, okay. I'm the safety guy? Wow. <laughs> you're all in trouble. Oh, uh, I was asked, by the way, um, by a structural engineer who said, whoever it was that took the bridge report, can we have it back, please? That really wasn't for uh, release to answer everyone. There's not enough copies to go around. So some of the information that's out there is actually for other people to look through as well. So whoever has it, you will be searching on your way out. Um, can we have it back? No questions asked. Um, so the, the, the safety goes to a number of things. Uh, it talks about lighting, it talks about rails and uh, wayfinding and be able to find your way up and down and not fall off the edge when you're chasing something or if you stop your bike short, somebody doesn't run around you and fall off. Um, and you can see where you're going. It's really simple. So the concepts of what we have to deal with in public safety are actually quite simple. And it's somewhere where you feel safe, that you're happy to use, that you're happy that your family uses. Uh, and so all of these things have to kind of come together. And again, we, we heard a lot of what you said um, about various things in terms of lighting and uh, being able to uh, police it and get vehicles up there for the police to, to go through and, and, and all that sort of thing. So um, the, the one thing that we've, um, and this is an old slide, and we still um, put it up there because it's actually probably one of the most important things. What we've not done is designed the lighting. But we have said, um, very importantly, that the lighting shouldn't extend beyond the width of the trail. So what we also don't want is dark spots. So the, the lighting needs to be uniform, uh, or certainly illuminated, to a very low level, so that you're not dealing with highs and lows, and there's nowhere for the bad guys or gals to hide, um, and jump out on you, and, and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's a constant, constantly illuminated, but not spilling out into the neighborhood not spilling out into the residences next door. Um, the, the other element we talked about was, was fencing and rails. And again, uh, this is an opportunity to, do, to go without one of two routes. You could put up a very strong fence, a uh, very solid fence, and it would become both intimidating for people looking up as to, well, you know, how do you actually get up there? It seems like a barrier. And also for people on the trail, um, it's a case that you, you now feel kind of claustrophobic in this space. And so one of the things we concentrated on was making that very open, so that there was this porosity that you could see what was going on both up and down, uh, and being able to, again, stop people from falling off the edges and be safe and make sure that everyone was well taken care of. So, uh, and again, we've not designed the fence, but we've set certain criteria for what it should be, um, and how porous it should be, and, and the kind of the quality of material. The other thing to remember about fencing is, there's a lot of it. There's, you know, um, just under three miles on one side and just under three miles on the other. So if you, I mean, those of you, you know, who have put up any kind of fence know that fences get expensive. So if you go crazy on the fence, you're kind of going to end up fencing in nothing at all because there'll be no money left to do anything on the trail. So the, the, the challenge that we had as the team, and uh, I think the team was risen to, is how do we do this, um, not cheaply, but cost effectively and achieve all of the goals that we need to achieve. And I think that the, the concept that they come up with and some of the precedents are actually really quite illuminating. Uh, and then the last piece of this is wayfinding and, and how do you get around? How do you find out where to get up, where to get down, what's around, uh, why am I on this thing, where can it take me? 
Uh, and that, you know, uh, Andrew mentioned signs before about dealing with speed uh, and warnings, which is very important. But the wayfinding element of it, we, you know, we've been talking about that this should be, it should be part of the art. It should feel part of the trail. It should be also intuitive. There should be visual clues in how it's lit. Uh, and so all of these things came into the thought of the wayfinding elements and how you interpret, rather than just putting a sign saying you need to go this way if you want anything. Um, just kind of expressing these things in, in much more sort of uh, artistic and welcoming fashion. Uh, objective six, this is a place where John uh, is now going to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, John Pounds, Chicago Book Art Group. Uh, I was thinking what Carol said a little bit ago about this being uh, the 100th birthday. And I think we should go with that metaphor a little bit because 100 years ago the city really did give itself a gift, which was a gift of safety. It raised the tracks. It meant that a whole lot of people were safer when they had to travel around the neighborhoods. It was really a wonderful thing. It was a very important thing that the city decided to give itself. We, at this moment, have the ability to do another gift to the city. And it is a gift for this moment, but it's also the gift for the years out, untold years out. And we should really see it as that kind of an opportunity where we are giving ourselves this incredible opportunity to not only have a park, but to have conversations, perhaps arguments, dialogues, that we talk to strangers and that we talk about things that we believe are important for the future. It's the gift we're giving ourselves in this kind of a moment because we are making this place collectively and together. It is to be a living work of art. Uh, in that sense, the Bloomingdale Trail really does need to have a sense that people, when they go to it, love it. They stay there. They come back and they see it change and evolve. This takes a lot of different forms, but it really does mean that we will have to have as big of a scope as we can imagine at this time, and a little bit bigger. The scope, in fact, is not simply can we do something that lasts for 20 years or 50 years. The scope is some pieces should perhaps only last for a day or overnight, some for a month or a year. Some pieces may last for five years and get altered along the way by the same person who put them up, or something may last for 20 years. But the way in which we put this together, whether it's performance art, whether it's ways in which the programming, which is important to the trail, happens in a very artistic way, the way in which artists that we can't even now imagine who are not yet quite born are going to be creating work on this trail, which will continue to unfold a wide variety of projects that we won't even try to name in this moment, except they should be as wide a variety as we can imagine. There are some things that we can do. Uh, one is to really embed infrastructure in the, pro in the design process. Uh, that is electricity and water, certainly, but not just electrical lights to light the trail and make it safe, but we know that both on the trail and under the trail, today we know that electricity powers a whole lot of things. We may be able to have access to very effective solar-powered generators in the future, but we don't have that yet. We know that sometimes water or gravity or other kinds of forms are just present. And what we need to do in the design process, and what we're recommending here, is that the design really embed the kind of infrastructure that will allow people to unfold new ideas in the future at specific locations, because they don't have to go in and dig, dig up the landscape or tear something out in order to put it there. That said, there are a lot of places to happen. The ramps, the walls, the underpasses, up on the surface itself. There are a lot of ways and places that art can be done. The way that it needs to be done is a combination of renew, restore, renews, re, <laughs> restore, renew, and create. There are pieces on the trail that should be restored, if they can be at all. In particular, I call out the one at California, Children of the Future, 30 years old was first tagged about seven years ago. It's gotten a couple of tags since then, but it actually is a really positive piece that indicates the importance of children to the future of the world and the importance of caring for children. And that piece really should be a candidate for restoration if it can be at all. There are other pieces that might be restored. There are other pieces that may be renewed instead. And when I say renewed, I mean that there are pieces that are done with a spirit and an inclination and an idea that is really important and really lively. And it may be that the place where that piece is built has to 
to be destroyed, that has to be taken apart and transformed to become something else. But the possibility of renewing, not specifically the peace that was there, but the spirit that put the peace there, the hope that is embedded, the consciousness that is in the minds of artists as they do work about ecology, or about the future, or about population growth, or whatever it happens to be, that we have ways and places for people to renew this, those ideas in new places. And finally, there is a lot of places to create new work as well. Certainly with all the construction that's going on, with all of the really great work that has to be done with the landscaping and the engineering, there are places and moments when art can be embedded in that really beautifully, really effectively, and really cost-effectively. Cost, we're recommending 5% of the entire budget, each step of the budget we put out, set aside for art and art development. That is a modest goal. It will have a major impact. If you think of it as 5% of the cost and 5% of the experience of the trail, I think you're, you're getting a lot for 5%. But we really are recommending that as a very serious investment be given to make certain that this trail is a living work of art. Okay, um, so those, that's a summary of the objectives. When um, the framework plan is published in the next couple weeks, there is a lot more detail. We've hit the high points tonight. And um, what we'd like to do now is take you on a trip down the Bloomingdale Trail the way we envision it um, in a few years. So um, starting at, at the West Trail at, at the YMCA, um, here we are anticipating a ramp to Ridgeway important. We are providing access for maintenance vehicles and emergency vehicles um, at intervals. And finally, we're, we're looking forward to uh, making a cycle connection to Armitage here. Um, before, uh, I do want to say one thing about the west end of the trail. Um, from here to Spalding Avenue, um, it, the there are some industrial users who will still be using the trail when we open it in 2014 that we're likely to be using it. And um, we have a couple different strategies for that, and it's important for you to understand that there may be an intermediate step here where um, we will have um, maybe shared usage or maybe um, access only starting at Spalding. And that'll depend on the negotiations the city has over the next um, short period of time. Um, okay, so Ridgeway to Drake. Here we're looking at a, um, a vegetated slope, you know, the overpass at Kimball. Uh, formerly that was sidings. We think that would make a wonderful place to make one of these parks that, that, that simply pour up to the trail, I guess, or the trail pours down to the park. Um, again, we anticipate that we can use this to access the trail for maintenance and emergency vehicles. Um, at Sawyer Whipple, there are two pieces to this. This is one of the spots where we will have a ramp stair connection. You can see it coming off Ketsy here. And um, then you know, we also have the opportunity to um, connect to that existing park. In fact, one of the ideas that we've been um, included in our guidelines actually in our discussion is that perhaps that could be something playful like a slide. Um, Humboldt in California. This is really um, one of the really exciting points on the trail. Here, um, for consideration, the design guidelines are going to include, first of all, a ramp. You can see that here. So that's the typical ramp that we've shown a few times. Um, but the really exciting part, we think, is the uh, opportunity to create a mirador looking um, up and down Humble Boulevard. at Humboldt and California. Um, again, the planned improvements include ramps. You can see one there, and you can see one over here at Mozart, one in California. So these are sort of the, uh, the typical um, city grid connections. Can you go back just a little bit? Okay, yeah, I want to make sure I covered everything. I was, okay, next slide. Um, Rockwell, um, Rockwell, between Rockwell and Western, Again, here we'll have two um, typical city grid type connections, light touch connections. 
And again, another possibility for a Mirador. This time at Western. Uh, between Winnebago and Hoyne. Um, this is a park that Janet and, and Beth both referred to in the introduction. And so you'll be seeing that coming online soon. Um, and because the park is being planned at the same time that the trail is, this will definitely be a park where you'll be able to access the trail with a gently sloping path. Um, in fact, you can see the plan for it here. I think it's going to be a really marvelous uh, improvement. Between Damon and Wood, um, again, we have a ramp at Damon, our, our urban ramp. And then we um, want to uh, use the vegetated slope approach between Damon and Winchester. And again, this little, this little slide shows some of the possibilities we, that we see for miradors and places um, where we could make the trail a little bit wider, give you a place to sort of step out over the intersection and uh, survey the neighborhood. Between Wood and Ashland, we're anticipating, again, a ramp connection, possibly a Mirador. And um, why don't we go right to the next one, because I think that this is an exciting image. Um, we've worked really hard to sort out some of the traffic here. And we've decided that uh, we are recommending that our major access be at Marshfield. This will help um, cyclists and other people who want access to the trail um, to keep them off Ashland. But we are planning on a, a new park at Ashland that would um, slope gently up to the trail. And this would be our eastern trailhead. So how are we going to get this all done? Janet has a secret. <laughs> Janet will tear in from Thank you. Um, so these next couple of slides, uh, uh, some of this will be familiar. There's a little bit more detail on that. The process, of course, that we've all been going through in doing this framework and doing the phase one is really trying to define that vision. Um, the framework plan has two main goals. And one is to understand what that large vision is, and the second one is to start to help prioritize those for um, you know, the first round of funding and how we will continue to move forward. And so that's really the effort that we've been doing. We also know, of course, that we have um, managed to receive and secure um, uh, CMAC funding for this project. It's a little over 46 million. Of course, it's very important when we say that number that you recognize that the way the feds work is that they say, okay, here's the number. We'll give you 80% 80 80 of that. You need to come up with the 20%. So, and that's our, our private fundraising goal that's going along with this project. And so that's the, that's the amount when we start to talk about, well, how do we prioritize? We've, we've, we've talked about the vision. We know we have a certain amount of funding. What is it we're going to be able to do um, for that amount of funding, and how do we go about prioritizing that? And you saw that in some of the presentation um, in terms of access points and those kinds of things, um, trying to be realistic about what can happen in this number. And that's partly true because, if you look at the next slide, we talked a lot about that infrastructure. And the good news is, is that infrastructure is in pretty good shape. A lot of it can be reused, but it does need repair. It needs, you know, some of it needs a fair amount of repair. Some of it's a little bit of repair. But that, that of course, is not uh, an insignificant cost to, to bring this structure that was not designed for this use to the point where we can really use it. Um, so drainage and bridges and um, uh, uh, retaining walls and all of the things that we need to do that. And so we know that that's going to take somewhere in the order of at least half of the money that we've secured. And so we have another half to get the trail in and the access points and all those things um, so that we can uh, ride from end to end. And then, of course, we know that there's more than that, that we have created a vision that goes beyond that. And we were very specific in that desire and that goal, that we wanted to do that. We didn't want to have some sort of defined, oh, this is what we've got, this is all there is. Um, because this is going to be something, as John, I think, so elegantly points out, this is a living, growing process. 
And we know that there are going to be ideas that are going to come that we haven't even been able to think of yet and capture. And that as this thing becomes uh, a real project and something that we all get to touch and feel and ride on, we're all going to be coming up with new ideas and new visions for the trail. And hopefully we've created a framework plan that is going to allow for that to happen in a meaningful and consistent way um, that will uh, always lead to a um, beautiful and high quality project. So um, in the interest of that, we prepared these slides. Uh, you know, don't take any of this too seriously. We don't know exactly what this is going to be ourselves, but we wanted to make two points with these. One is that we've showed you a lot of really beautiful images today. Uh, we feel very strongly about those images, but we all have to remember that landscaping does not magically come in the 20-year form, and of course, that's how we all like to render it. <laughs> um, we like to render those trees in the really big, big form, and they don't start off that way, right? They start off small, your, your beautiful perennial breads, they go in and they're little plants. Um, and so everyone sort of has to be real, real realistic about that, and we wanted to do this sort of imaging so that people can sort of understand that, you know, the 20-year um, vision, or maybe sooner, but, it, you know, this is not what magically springs up on day one, that it is a process, that it really is a living and growing um, uh, a trail, and that there is going to be these phases that are going to occur over time. Next slide. Um, this is just really brief. You've all sort of lived through this. Um, this has been our schedule in terms of our public process. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, this is our uh, last large public meeting for the phase one. Uh, there will be more. Next slide. Um, we are in that process of finalizing these two pieces. Uh, the framework plan uh, will be out by the end of this month. Uh, the project development report, which is that part that I've sort of uh, hinted at that, um, and we've talked about a little bit, that's sort of been going on in the background, and, and informing it, this process, uh, framework process, very much. But understanding, um, you know, uh, what those conditions are, those bridges, so we could understand what those costs are, understand what the safety uh, issues are around those, those structures, um, understand what it is that we'll be um, purchasing from the railroad, all that kind of good stuff. That, too, is going to be wrapping up this month. It then has to go through a long approval process with the state, so we probably won't get actual formal approval until around August, um, but uh, that will be submitted. Um, and then, of course, um, with all of these things, of course, we have an ongoing um, fundraising component that will be continuing through all of this. So those are some of the next steps. Next slide. So this is pretty much the end um, of our formal presentation. We're going to uh, uh, obviously have some Q&A, but I do want to say a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank all of you and all the people that are not here today but have participated in this process. Um, for me personally, this has been uh, an amazing project to uh, participate in. There has been incredible feedback from the community. This is a project that grew out of the community, um, and it's been really wonderful. And I really want to thank all of you for giving us your time and your effort, and I hope you will continue to do so. As Beth said, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. So thank you all very much. Um, I also have to thank my team. Um, uh, there have been a lot of people, obviously, putting a lot of effort into this and will continue to do so. Uh, David Leopold and Dolan McMillan um, from CDOT have been great. There's also a really wonderful group of people here that you heard from tonight um, that have just done a wonderful job, um, I think, at um, listening to all of you and, and trying to pull all this together and, and still have a lot of work to do to pull it all off in the next couple of weeks. Um, but uh, as you've heard, we've got Eric and Ross Barney and Michael Van Volkenberg, Chicago Public Art Group, O&H Community Partners. You might not see them as much, um, but these guys are really doing a great job. Uh, Burns and McDonald, Neil and Leroy and Dynasty. I just have to mention them because they've been a great team um, and it's been great. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about all the wonderful partners. This is, uh, I know I'm here and I'm standing in front of you as CDOT, but the Park District who is here in force um, of course, has been integral to this. The Trust for Public Land, uh, the Department of um, Housing and Economic Development, and also the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. I, I will now stop thanking, but um, I, I just felt it was really important to, to let you know, not just to thank those people, but to let you know that this is a team of people that are really working on this, um, and that uh, 
this effort is going uh, going to be continued going to forward. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I totally skipped this, and I, I will shoot myself for this. Um, of course, of course, the friends of Bloomingdale Trail, uh, who have been integral from uh, from the beginning. So with all that, I'm just going to do a few reminders and we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, this is being court recorded. Um, so unlike some of our other ones, please, when you come up and ask a question, state your name. If you have a challenging name to spell, please spell it for us um, so that we can record that uh, accurately. Um, we have um, our written um, comment cards that are here. Um, because this is our formal IDOT meeting of all of the meetings, then we do need comments in writing. Um, the, the, what, if you, when you come and ask your question, that will be recorded. But please, um, I know we're probably not going to have enough time to answer everyone's. Please, there will be these cards. Uh, we'll be passing them out. They were up front. Please uh, feel free to give it to us in writing uh, if you don't feel comfortable coming up or you don't have time to uh, get your question out. There was also up front when you walked in an FAQ. Uh, we updated that from what was on the website. I think now it's actually on the website, too, the new one. Um, but that's out there. It's printed. It's in English and it's in Spanish. Um, so please pick that up. It answers a lot of the questions that, um, you know, just the basic ones that everyone needs to sort of know and understand um, so that hopefully um, you won't, uh, you know, need to ask those if you can uh, see that in the FAQ. I think... Those are all my sort of um, uh, just facts that I need to make sure that we get out. And with that, I think we will take questions. There is a mic, so if people can come up and stand in line, and we will run through questions. Thank you all very, very much. Possibility. We've moved the high traffic. It, in, on most places along the trail, we have houses on one side and a road on the other, Bloomingdale. And in almost every case, when you look at that trail alignment, we've moved it away from the houses and we've used the space along the houses as a planting area. Additionally, where we can and where it makes sense, we've changed the topography so that the walkers, bicyclists, are below the level of the um, of the um, of the houses, and I know that the drawings that we sh the drawings we show. Oh, by the way, I have to tell you, um, there are two guys from my staff back there, Nico Sanchez and Sandrine Kim, who did all those drawings, and I, they've done they turned them around like in a day, and I want to thank them. However, saying that these are 
the architectural term I think is eyewash. And I think that you really should look at them for the ambience and look at the trail alignment when it's finally published to answer your concern about um, privacy. I, can, I guarantee you, the one I showed about privacy, the side that was solid with mines or trees or, or, de, or, or um, by a lower elevation, that's the side that's on the houses to the largest extent that we could do it, which is almost always. In what cases are, is it not then? Because you know, that's why, that, that, that's terrible for them. You know, that's why I, I, since I don't have the full alignment up here, that's why I can't tell you that right now. And that's why I urge you to um, examine the alignment when it's published. And um, it, I, I don't, I don't know where your house is. Maybe we could actually yeah, look where it is. But, but um, I think, I think, I think what's really important to note here, this, this is the framework plan. Um, and that it is not the design. So we have not um, figured out every, where every screen wall is going to be, where every tree, where every bump has been, but we have been very true to those things that we very much heard and very much heard from you personally um, uh, about the, uh, making sure that we followed all those rules that we had set up. So, um, I, and also I think too that uh, what you saw today is is the abbreviation so we tried actually not to repeat too much everything that we'd already sort of really hit in some of the earlier meetings because we wanted to make sure that we were giving some new information that people didn't have and there was a lot so um, we can certainly talk more afterwards but we we have we privacy is something we have heard over and over and over again we feel it's very important and we have tried to put in a series of tools because this is the framework plan to try to address those concerns. Changes in elevation, where we put the path, uh, screening. You saw it even in the seating little vignettes, the little cross sections, about how you place seating in such ways that it can create barriers, uh, uh, direct views away from people's private homes, all those kinds of things. We've tried to do that. So that's, that's how we've tried to address those issues. My name is Alan Mellis. Just a couple of quickies. Um, one is, um, <coughs> At previous meetings, Alderman Cologne has always indicated he would like to see this as a world-class facility, and I agree. And therefore, I think we need to look at wayfinding beyond what was presented here, and that the wayfinding has to show the connections to the community, especially to the business areas, because this hopefully will become an economic development engine for the community. And I realize it's not maybe physically part of the trail, but if someone's coming here from Paris, France, to see the Bloomingdale Trail, you don't want them to get lost, you want them to be able to get there, if they take public transportation, there's all that sign. So I just hope you add those couple of sentences in your wayfinding. And second of all, um, you talked about minimizing pedestrian and bike conflicts at entrances. I hope you take that at entrances out. I hope one of your guidelines, I've said this before, is to minimize pedestrian and bike conflicts. Because even though I do appreciate you have a mile and a half that's separated, if you're taking a walk and realizing that the lakefront is an exception, not the rule, but I'll tell you, that little, I think it's like a half a foot pedestrian path on the lakefront for people walking doesn't, doesn't make it a pleasant experience. So I really hope you extend this idea of separating bikes and pedestrians to more than um, the, the one and a half miles we'll get for the whole uh, length of the trail. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Roberto Lopez. I came to this uh, neighborhood 45 years ago. I'm from Mexico City. So I came to work uh, at a factory that used to be here in the Bloomington Trail. Uh, before it wasn't called a Bloomington Trail, it was part of a system of um, industrial corridors. When Chicago used to be the industrial city number one in the world, I would get up in the morning and go to work. And I said, oh my God, what feeling? <coughs> so I would like to see something that relates to the history of the working people here and Chicago being an industrial city and this place being an industrial corridor. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Edward Litt. 
and I live over the over Damon Avenue and I'm Willow. And we are very worried because right now we're having rapes there, we're having uh, robberies, police can't even control it. And how would you like it if your neighbor looks in your window or throws a rock? They can't even, I, we got graffiti on our buildings, the city can't even get in there to do it. I think you should think of what you're doing and I hope that the property values don't go down when this thing comes up. That is our concern. The safety more than anything else. Because right, that was when that girl got uh, hit over the head two years ago on Damon Avenue. And then we had two robberies and then you had something the other day. Police can't control it. Where are you going to have the safety with the police? I like that all. Well, you know, obviously we've, we've, we've looked at safety a lot. Um, it's a big use. We do feel obviously having the trail become a public amenity uh, versus a, um, a railroad private property that is um, only partially used and no one's monitoring the access to it and all of those issues is going to obviously really be a, a big change. Um, there are many uh, philosophies about uh, eyes on the street, about bringing uh, positive uses to a space and how that can change the safety and the security. We also recognize, though, that safety and security is something that you don't do by yourself. I think uh, efforts from the police around caps and those things, it's very important that it's a community process. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm putting the burden on the community, but we want, you know, it's something that we have to work very closely as this project um, develops and, and is built out to work with the community, understanding where those issues are, what's the best way. Um, I will say that the uh, police have been an incredible partner with us so far on this project and I know they're gonna continue. Um, they have been at almost all of our meetings. Um, they have been listening to all of this. They've been hearing it. They've been giving us feedback about how to design it in such a way that it can be uh, meaningfully patrolled by them and, and what's their best thought around that. Um, so uh, we are doing our best to try to address that and we will continue, obviously, as the um, details get uh, fleshed out and working with all of you. Hi, I'm Blair King. Um, two questions. Uh, I read in the uh, FAQ material before I came over here that um, the trail is being designed for bikes that are supposed to go less than 20 miles an hour. You didn't mention that tonight, and I'm just curious if that's still true. If it is still true, is this still considered a commuter facility? Originally, that was part of the, one of the selling points for it. The other question is has to do with financing. Um, this is the first time I've heard that uh, $9 million in private funds are part of the $46 million cost. Is raising $9 million in private funds, is the trail's con first phase, is the first phase of the trail contingent upon raising $9 million, and if so, how much of that money has been raised? Um, do you want to answer the first question? Uh, yeah. Um, the answer is yes, but the, it's still 20 miles an hour. Um, and yes, we still see this as a, a commuter route. Uh, maybe not as a commuter superhighway, but still as a commuter route. Um, and all along we've tried to balance usage, realizing that usage will happen in different modes at different times of day, and at different days of the week. Um, so I think that you know the, um, the commuter times are less likely to have uh, families and small children than um, at different times of the day and certainly the weekends. So I think there's a, there's a mix of usage um, as, as well as a mix of times and days. Um, but I still think you know, 20 miles an hour is, you know, I, I don't know how fast you cycle, but it's still a pretty fair click for a cyclist consistently. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that, you know, this is um, three, three miles. Um, serious cyclists who go more than 20 miles an hour would probably not think about using it, would stay on the streets. Um, because you know, there's also serious cyclists who cycle to work um, and cycle to where they're going and messengers 
they kind of like the raw battle with the vehicles and it's kind of like a badge of honor. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. Um, so this is, the, the idea is that this would be, in, in my mind anyway, this is how I envision it, that this is um, a tool to encourage the um, slightly less brave, the more timid uh, people who might do it if there was a safe way to do it. So people who drive now, that the whole idea of the CMAC is the congestion mitigation. So it's taking people who drive now or uh, even use public transport, taking them out and putting them on their bikes and giving them a safe route that they can feel secure and that they don't have to yell and swear and make various hand gestures to, to drivers as they pass by and cut them off. And so um, I, I think that uh, the answer to the first question maybe is yes. Oh, sorry. sorry, we're going to answer part two of this question. Um, so yes, CMAC funding, and I, I think we've been pretty clear about this in earlier meetings, um, always does require the 20% match, and that 20% match always has to come local. That's part of the way the feds do this process, and that's because they want to make sure that the, the agencies that they give these to and the communities that they give it to are really committed. Um, and that they're really serious and that's always been so to do um, part of that process. And of course, um, we've been very aware of that from day one. Um, and so that is uh, in part why we have a series of partners that are part of this project. And that includes um, the Trust for Public Land because uh, they've been very instrumental in um, uh, having that conversation with us uh, and, and, and uh, helping us to formulate a strategy to move forward. And I think Beth might say a few words about that. Sure. Um, the, as Janet just explained, the $46 million is what's been identified, and that is the construction budget. still hasn't been designed, but we are committed to the private fundraising campaign to make sure that the local match is coming from the private campaign. So it won't be state and local governments? It's, it's not the $9 million. Not the $9 million. How much of that have you raised? We, we have not even announced the campaign yet, but we're committed to, to getting there, Blair. I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi. My name is Mike Scheidler. <clears throat> I have a comment about privacy and security issues. Um, the Bloomingdale Trail has been unlit and accessible to criminal activity for the last 30 years. And I have my own personal doubts that Illuminating it, making a conduit for the public welfare is going to make it any more a conduit than crime. And if there hasn't been a crime wave in the last 30 years along that line, I suspect it will not come once it's been developed and embraced by the community. And I just want to mention that because certainly I think between street level and your private residences, you're still far more vulnerable than you're going to be if you're up and there's a moat between you and your private residence. Um, I just had a comment on that, because I live nearby the trail too, and I remember the days before everything was cut down, and it was a veritable Eden, groves of trees and wildflowers, and it had some real topography, you could lose track that you were in Chicago. So I'm hoping, in looking at the slideshow, that this project might push the trail back into that direction, and uh, turn it into something more than the pollen garden it is now in the summertime which is a sad thing to see. And I had a question. I wondered about materials. Um, has wood been considered in terms of the railing or possibly uh, the footpaths that go along the trail? Wood chips or uh, two-tiered wood railing? Or are we talking more uh, industrial strength materials? Um, we haven't identified uh, specific materials for the trail yet. I mean, obviously, um, uh, durability is going to be a big factor. You know, everything that goes on up there is going to be done in, you know, large quantities. Um, and uh, so, you know, economics, durability will all be a factor. Um, the uh, part of the um, our thoughts about the railing is that we could use potentially wood as, as you know part of maybe the rub rail for the bikes, um, but those are things that you know certainly would develop. Um, 
as we move further down into the next the next phase of the project. Right on. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dan Merck. I'm a resident. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure because I think that's what this plan is about today. Um, what it seems is the access points at the parks, the grading is going to come down and more or less spill into the parks, correct? Okay, that, that sounds like a nice plan. Uh, I'm most familiar with Churchill Park, I live right near there, and I see that. Now when you cross Damon Avenue on the west side, it appears that you want to have a ramp coming up there. Now, that's going to be very, very small in there because there's condo buildings there. So it's going to be a little cavernous. It's going to be dark, even if it's lit. And because of the configuration of the in there, uh, someone has alluded that's where the lady got uh, hit with the bat a couple years ago and everything. So safety may be an issue. It's very, very heavily trafficked. I think as a congestion point, that's, that's going to be a bad thing. My suggestion is to eliminate that ramp. You've got a lot of access there. You've got people with dogs. There's a dog park there, as I'm sure you're aware of. You're going to have a lot of traffic crossing Damon, and I think it's just an accident waiting to happen. So my suggestion is to eliminate that ramp. Also, the tracks curve right there, and they get slim. So when you come up, it's going to be very tight. And with the big spillage into the park on the east side, I, I feel that that's more than enough access, and it'll save a couple bucks. Is that a possibility? Go, go, go. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, again, we, we've identified places where it could happen. Uh, doesn't always necessarily mean it will or even should happen. Um, the, the, the geometry is such that that allows us a place where it could physically happen. Uh, and there was a really nice rendering of where it came down. But you also mentioned things like accidents wait to happen. The, the, that would come with you know lights, and then we clearly wouldn't just have bring that down as a ramp to the street. There's a, there's a whole program that again we're, we're not shown tonight, and doesn't sometimes always appear on the renderings because it's not you know the the, the, the pretty part. Um, but but there's, a, there's an element where you have to have railings, and you have to have uh, striping, and showing people that this is an area to slow down, and that you can't just speed through and that sort of thing. So all of these things we. We've thought about, uh, and the, the Damon one was an access point where we thought would be good to get a vehicle up there um, because of the width and, and what it meant for the, the locations. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it could, and we'll certainly, you know, um, think about it and uh, take it forward. The other thing too, in addition to what Tom just mentioned, is one of the things, and you know, it's just hard in this amount of time to get everything across. We have spent a lot of time actually thinking about this project, not just from the top down, but from the bottom up. And when you look at a major street like Damon, um, and when you have a park on one side, one of the things that you already observe about um, Churchill Park is that it has an entrance that's mid-block. And so people have a tendency to cross the street um, in the middle of the block. And we know that we're going to bring even more people to the project. And so one of the things we've looked at very carefully, and if you look at the plan outside, you'll see it in more detail, um, is really trying to have access points on both sides of some of these major streets whenever we can fit them in so that we can avoid that. So that the bicyclist or the pedestrian coming down one side doesn't go, oh, I want to get up to the Bloomingdale Trail, and they dodge across right in front of a viaduct, which already doesn't have the best sight lines in the world. Um, so we're anticipating an increase. Now we're going to do wayfinding. I mean, there's a whole series of things that have to happen to try to make that happen. But we also looked very carefully at that. So I think the points you brought up are very big, uh, very important. But just to let you know, one of the important driving factors for us was that, is to try to prevent that sort of mad dash mid-block across the street. And we're going to do things like inform people this is the safe place to cross and all those kinds of things too. But um, we recognize that people have a habit of doing that. And so we really looked very carefully at that and where we could fit it in. We at least made the recommendation um, about having the access on both sides. So that you know, if you want to go northbound or southbound and you come down off the trail, you don't decide that you know, you're just going to run across the street and uh, you know, possibly create a dangerous situation for yourself and for vehicles. Okay, because the sidewalk on the, on the west side of Damon is 
this big. Right, um, and it has to yeah. be it has to be set back enough. There has to be right. a distance for stopping. There has to be a lot of communication tools. To totally agree, and that's a good point. And, and they may not all be perfectly communicated in these renderings, but there are a lot of points that are spelled out in the framework plan around those kinds of things. And some of that you'll see public put up in the hall because we couldn't kind of walk you through all of that, or we would, as I said, be here for several hours tonight. But that it's your points are very well taken. Uh, I just want to share with you some of our thoughts. Okay. One, one last thing. Um, I realize this is the plan. When will if we get down to the nuts and bolts implementation and then I can bring some residents and we will actually talk about that specific spot when the construction is going to start? Uh, in the development of the construction documents is when that will all happen. And there'll be meetings. Yes. Thank you. Those last three people. Okay. Yes, last three questions. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Chris Holden. I was part of a number of visioning sessions over five years ago through the Blue Indian Trail, and my visions of what I wanted from it have changed over time. Originally, I saw it, I live in Kensington Palmer, and I saw it as a great way to, you know, that commuter corridor or, or bicycle riding. Um, and I saw it as something that would be open late at night and have lighting, and you know, my thoughts have changed over time. Um, I had the pleasure of spending the day after Thanksgiving on the High Line in New York City, which I don't know how many of you have been on it or seen it, but it is really amazing. I'm so impressed and jealous of it. And I know that you guys have probably looked at a lot of the things about the design of it, the material. And I really liked that it was a place that gathered people to hang out. There's no bicycle on there, bicycling on there at all. It's really a pedestrian way. And I wouldn't mind at all if the Bloomingdale Trail had a small area for bikes. 20 miles an hour is quite a clip um, that you know kept the bikes completely separated all the way. It wants to be a commuter thing, that's great. That's the original thought of mine, assumption, hope. Um, but it would really impact the people who just want to come and hang out. Um, and the material on the walkway of the High Line, I don't know if it's cedar. Know, it's, it's, it's actually some, most of it's concrete plank. Right. Yeah. Oh, is it? The, the, yeah. It's so a textured it's concrete stuff. plank. Yeah, it's fake. Okay. Well, it's lovely, great drainage, looks beautiful. And the way it's designed, it easily guides people. It's not straight. That's the cool thing about it, is they'll put a garden here, we'll put a garden here. And the way they designed it, it leads people. It makes you almost think you're meandering, but you're actually kind of going along a straight thing. And it has limited access. It's closed at night, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, just, you know, I know even what I wanted a long time ago has changed, so hopefully everybody's mm -hmm. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Judy Norley, K-N-O-E-R-L-E. Uh, I live in that cute little area between Polina and Marshfield on Bloomingdale Trail. It's a I'm not, I'm Bloomingdale. Uh, it's that pathway. Uh, I've been historically a bit of a skeptic about this, and I'm warming up to it. I'm, I'm enjoying the, the, the views. Uh, what I haven't heard spoken about is, and maybe this is coming out in your document about how you're going to be developing. Obviously, we don't have thousands of worker bees that can do this simultaneously from the far west side to the far east side. I'm on the far east side. So if you started on the far west side, what, what, a couple questions. What prevents people from using the trail in the undeveloped areas while you're developing the west side? Is it a linear process? Will you put shrubbery up first where there's more privacy? Um, obviously, you're right. The trees won't be growing for 20 years. So how do I keep people from looking into my house while the trees are growing, while the, the shrubbery is growing? But mostly, what's your plan? Where does it start? Is there a starting point and an ending point? Is it linear? I'm just curious. I haven't heard you speak about that. Well, the, the plan is to get the project open from end to end. We've decided not to go the route of, you know, let's build these four blocks and then next we'll build four blocks. We decided instead to really emphasize the end to end and that um, the the level of those improvements will continue to grow over time. So there won't be the west end is opened and the east end isn't. There is, as was mentioned, the possibility that there might be a little bit of phasing that has to happen at the west end, depending on exactly when we can get all that property from the railroad. 
or, or how much we get right away and how much we might get over time and those kinds of things. But other than that, the issue is to get it open from end to end. Obviously, there's a moment when there's in construction, but when it's in construction, it won't be open really to anybody during that time, right? The whole site will become a construction site, and there will be activity happening all along the entire thing because the whole thing is being done from end to end in terms of the, that vision. So that was the way we sort of looked at that. We are not looking at it as we're going to open the west end and then maybe you know a year later we're going to open up the east end. That's not the way we're envisioning the phasing, and that's not how it's being proposed in the framework plan. All right, does that that helps? Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brian Hacker. I'm a resident of the Humboldt Park neighborhood. Uh, and uh, I don't know if maybe I'm getting ahead of where you're at right now, but uh, given that this is such a high-profile project, I feel like the city has an opportunity to um, you know set an international example for you know its guidelines and its priorities in this. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak any more to the commitment to uh, having green design elements and green infrastructure as part of the uh, the trail. You know, I saw a couple of, like, almost like token examples, like there's a rain garden on the slide, but, um, you know, is there a priority for saying making this like uh, having, you know, all on-site stormwater management, uh, previous pavements, uh, you know, having those elements being educational too and uh, teaching people about environmentalism, you know, uh, things like that? Uh, there's three questions in there. Um, porous paving and uh, infiltration. Well, I'm more interested. I, I, I'm, I'm, sorry. sorry, I was going to say yes, yes. Um, the education piece, absolutely. Um, part of the, the bit, in my mind, of sustainability that doesn't ever get addressed is that there's an education piece to it of not only what was done and how it works, but how it's going to evolve and how it's going to improve. And so the sustainability aspect of it is incredibly important. Um, there's very little you can do in terms of, well, I, sh I should rephrase that. There's already a lot done for us in the fact that we're taking a brownfield site. Where uh, the, the, the mechanism by which this project is being brought forward is congestion mitigation. So there's that element to it as well. So we're taking the idea to take cars off the road and, and promote cycling to work. So there's that, there's that sort of underlying piece. There's the materials we use, and we have talked about porous pavement. We've talked about different treatments. We've talked about um, uh, self-sustaining landscapes. Um, so, so low maintenance, low irrigation, um, materials that last for a long time, that are um, as inexpensive as we can. It's a very fine balance between um, cost and uh, longevity. And so all of these things come into play. Um, sustainability is a very important piece, um, and we, I say we, the, the designers that I've talked to, and, and one of the reasons that we work together, is that we all think about it not as a separate piece that sits over there and like, yeah, you know, when's Tuesday, let's have a sustainability talk. It's actually in everything that we do, the, the materials we choose, why we choose them, the, the mix of, even if we go to, to concrete and, and asphalt, the mix of reused materials and the type of bitumens you use comes into play. So there's lots of things and lots of ways that sustainability plays into it. So um, it, it's a massive subject, and the answer in a very small nutshell is absolutely. Thank you. I guess I would just close by saying that personally I'd like to see it be more of a uh, part of the public relations you know, the campaign and a fundamental element of the project. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank you for those comments, sir, before you walk away and as far as the, the public campaign. Um, one of the critical pieces that we're working on um, at the Trust for Public Land, the Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail and the Chicago Park District are all the programming elements and sort of the sustainability, the environmental issues that you raise. Have, as Tom just said, has been incorporated into the overall design. We're also incorporating those elements into the programming that we want to do during the design process, during the construction process, and after the, the park and trail are up and running. There are five schools along the trail, so we're working with those schools and developing curriculum. The Friends of the Bloomingdale Trail is an ongoing docent program. 
um, that they're doing now and will be expanding into the future. So I love your question, and I really appreciate you bringing up. It's not just the built environment, but it's also what people do on the trail and along the trail. So that's very much a, an important piece of it. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Maggie Martinez. I'm from the Humble Park area. And this is not new to me because I've been hearing it for over eight years part of the group that we started on this agree. Uh, and it sounds beautiful, but yet we still need to get the word out. We still need to reach more, more of our parents who are in the deep area. We need to do that to make sure they all know and come up with, uh, with your beautiful uh, talks and also to translate whatever you said, if it could be possible. Uh, I love the idea that you're going to be involved in the school because it's through the youth that they're going to be able to be up there and be those eyes and ears that we're going to need. I also need for you to involve the young people, the young adults. Those young adults have the skills in art that you would not believe. And we need to reach out to, to those young people so that they can be part of your arts that are going to go up there on those walls. We need them to get involved so they don't come and mess it up. Okay. <laughs> so that's why I think if you involve young people in that, we will have something positive upstairs. Something. It's going to be beautiful. I know that the people are talking about the danger in it, but I said if everybody puts their part, it will be something real nice. Now we also need you to keep in mind that we have a lot of skilled workers in our community. So we got to reach out to those community people that have skills that work, even to turn that dirt or knock down that wall. We have a lot of people that know how to do it. We have companies that do the rod ironing, so you gotta make sure that you hire these companies that are within this community. We don't want you to bring somebody from England to do whatever we need done on the that are in here, in this community, because our community does need work, and we need to make sure that they are proud of what they did, because this is their community, and this is what I need you to capture, that it's our community, it's all of our community that has to have part in it, that you are going to dig in that dirt and plant that plant in there, and that we are all going to be eyes and ears that we are going to get our aldermen to be involved in this, that we are going to get our police department to be involved in this, that we're going to have the bikers, the, the what do you call it, the camp of bicycle riders, that we're going to have them out there, that we're going to have young people riding their bicycles. we got to think of the future, and the open space is going to be wonderful for this community. So I know I have a lot of more things, and they're negative, but I wrote them down. <laughs> you can put those in the writing. <laughs> I have to tell you that I should have sat up here because it was hard to hear you back there. Very hard. All right. And the only one I heard was Janice. You had a good voice, but the rest, I could not hear you. And I don't know if you didn't have dinner or what. <laughs> That we not only work with our hands, and not only work with our minds, but we work with our hearts. And that's what we got to do. I know what Beth wanted to say something, but I also have to say that was a wonderful last uh, statement, and I really appreciated that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo Janet's comment and Maggie to thank you personally. And uh, Maggie, Maggie, I, I wanted to thank you personally because you have been working on this project from day one, long before I got involved six years ago. And I see you're sitting with Lucy uh, Gomez at Feliciano. And we, we want to thank you and ask you to come to every meeting and say what you just said. And we will continue to, to work to incorporate the arts into all of the civic engagement work that we're doing. 
And you're absolutely right. The community has to be a part of this and own it and help move it forward. So thank you. Those were very eloquent remarks, and we really take those to heart. And we'll speak louder next time. So thank you. Please enjoy the open house, but we have to be out of the building by 8. <laughs>